this session, um, if any of you watched soccer, the, you see, hear the phrase, especially English soccer, a game of two halves. This is a session of two halves. We can start off with Anthony talking about SSH remoting and troubleshooting and installing, probably not in that order. And then uh, I'm going to take over and look at WinRM remoting and troubleshooting. Any questions, keep ask them as we go. Um, we'll have questions at the end. You can catch us later. We'll be around. And I'm going to shut up. You're on. Cool. Thank you, sir. We good on audio? I think so. Okay. So this is uh, going to be PowerShell remoting with OpenSSH installation and troubleshooting. We're going to do that today. So we're going to start from basically a zero configuration system and get it all the way up to AD integrated authentication together. And then we're going to look at some things that can go wrong in doing that along the way. So I'm Anthony Nocentino, consultant, trainer, and founder of Centino Systems, where I do system architecture and performance. I like to make, build systems and make them go fast and do all that fun stuff. Uh, there's my contact info. Please, if you have any questions, email me, hit me up on Twitter, uh, whatever you want. It'll be at the end of the deck, too, uh, during the Q&A phase. I blog pretty frequently, and I'm a Pluralsight author. So a lot of the concepts today I have in Deeper Dive material on Pluralsight, so I have some free cards up here for you guys to get access to that content for free. And so let's talk about what we're going to talk about. How many of you folks were in the session yesterday that I did on OpenSSH? Okay, that's all. There's going to be a little bit of overlap, not too much, but I, there's some things that I had to have today uh, to kind of get some continuity in the conversation that you guys might have seen yesterday. So, but the context will be different. We're going to start off with installing OpenSSH on Windows and Linux, which is pretty cool, right, that we have this capability now. I'm very excited that that is the case. Then, of course, after installation, we need to get those users authenticated. We want to have them on our system configured and want to control who can have access to what. And we'll do that together on Windows and Linux. And then we'll layer on top of that PowerShell remoting, right? Because now the underlying substrate, or we have the option of the underlying substrate to move data with PowerShell remoting on OpenSSH, which is pretty darn cool. Uh, we'll talk about troubleshooting, some common errors that you'll see throughout and also uh, some common errors that you'll see, we'll talk about it throughout the conversation and also specifically at the end. And so let's start off with talking about installing OpenSSH on Windows and Linux. But before we do that, I do want to talk about the key features of OpenSSH and why it's critical to have that, or not critical, but why it's a good solution to be the underlying substrate for PowerShell remoting, because you get a lot of functionality out of the box with next to no configuration from your OpenSSH server. So the main thing is we have the ability to transmit data between two systems securely, right? We can encrypt it, we can guarantee that it's gonna get there and do things like that. We have the ability to do remote command execution. I can blast a command at a Linux system or a Windows system, it'll execute that command and via standard out, I'll be able to receive the output of that command on my local system. You guys are probably familiar with that concept with uh, what's the PowerShell remoting command, uh, the blast a command at invoke command, right, yeah? So we have that functionality as well. You guys have a little bit more of a sophisticated output with the whole object-oriented thing. We have to deal with that as byte stream data. I can move data around. I can copy files to, I can retrieve files from with no additional configuration out of the box functionality of SSH, right? Which is pretty cool, not having to open up shares and firewall ports and all that stuff that you have to do in Windows. Just kidding. Uh, and also the ability to uh, tunnel arbitrary TPC, uh, TCP services. So if I wanna have access to a remote system that is running a service that's not exposed to the internet, I can tunnel my traffic, get access to that thing as if it was running on my local machine. I just send the traffic over an SSH tunnel to that remote device. Another big thing with SSH, again, this is out of the box functionality, is that we ensure who the remote system is who it says it is, right? If you guys are using Windows-based remoting, you're used to the concepts with Kerberos and things like that that guarantee the authenticity of the remote system, right? Well, in a, a, a cross-platform environment and in a world where we might not trust the remote system or the rem domain, uh, lowercase d, not like Active Directory domain, or the domain of that other system, uh, we have the ability to authenticate that remote system with host keys, right? And that's gonna be able to authoritatively say that remote system is who it says it is. Message integrity is huge, right? Again, out of the box functionality with OpenSSH is did I send to the remote system, uh, did the remote system receive the command or the piece of data that I sent to it, right? Without having somebody come along and change that piece of data, right, in between. Because if I execute a command and someone intercepts that and then replays that command, that could be bad news, right? And of course, this is gonna be the underlying substrate for PowerShell remoting in the future, or at least as an option, right? 
So let's go through kind of the taxonomy of how we would install OpenSSH on Windows. This is a white hot topic, right? And very rapidly changing. Max and I were joking about this before the session, right? Because this thing changes very, very frequently. So I emailed Joey Aiello, who's the PM for PowerShell Core, and I believe OpenSSH is under his uh, control as well to get kind of the state of the art. So this is literally as of last week, right? And what this current state is. If you haven't, if you don't know, the PowerShell team is managing a fork of the actual OpenSSH code, and it's available to you on GitHub, right? And it's really cool that these guys are cultivating this. And at some time in the future, that might actually be one single code base. Hopefully that's the case. Um, if you want to, you can go to GitHub, read the code. I strongly encourage you guys, actually, I was having a conversation with Jeff Hicks last night about like the value of going through and reading the code for something as simple as OpenSSH or even things like Telnet, because then you can understand how things communicate between servers, how commands get to remote servers, and then get executed, right? So process execution, secure transmission, it's really cool stuff when you're talking about remote access and being able to do remote command execution. So I strongly encourage you guys to read the code. It's in C, it's challenging, but you know, it's cool. I'm like suppressing bad C jokes in my head. Uh, so here's the thing about PowerShell, or not PowerShell Core, OpenSSH on Windows. You're gonna get your hands dirty, right? Over the years, the installation has changed. When it first came out, you had to like literally uh, use PS exec to run the process as a certain user, use SC to register the service, and it was ugly. Now you basically you extract it and you run a PowerShell script, right? And I'm pretty sure that guy right there, Darwin, is the guy that's responsible for the simplicity of that. So everybody say thank you, right? And that's the value of open source, right? Is this guy right here can go and contribute this very valuable thing into a literally, no, not a Microsoft product per se, but into a product that's consumed by you guys, right? And going to become a core part of uh, the thing that we use that's PowerShell. So I think that's really cool. Uh, on the other side of the house, uh, it's going to become a Windows feature, right? It's in beta on Windows 10 and in the fall, in the fall creators update and the 17.09 build of Windows Server, right? So right now, huh? Okay. Oh, okay. So this, yeah, so the full story is there, right? Uh, for that was in late December of the release, right? And you get this functionality to be able to bring it. So it is just a client, is that the case? Yeah, it's just a client, all right. So it's just a client on for the, uh, as a Windows feature, it will become a feature in Windows Server in 2019. I cheat, I've cheated for a long time and I used Windows services for Linux to facilitate me getting access to the client because that's actual, I, don't, I shouldn't say that because that would undermine the work that the, OpenSSH, the Windows OpenSSH team did, but uh, I would use that, the Windows service for, services for Linux, install Bash Shell and then run SSH on there um, as a client. But certainly you can use the GitHub project and packed code as well. But the, sir? Is that right? Okay. Yeah, so these are like the things that we need to be concerned about when we were talking last night about like dropping that binary into particular location, particular paths, and potentially breaking things. So that, it's very white hot, right, from a development standpoint. So this is kind of the, like, what I think is the current state of affairs. And then also in 2019, it's gonna be a full-fledged feature, right guys? So I think that's pretty cool, right? Being able to install OpenSSH very easily. So now let's talk about the other side of the fence, Linux, right? How many of you guys are running in a cross-platform world, Windows, Linux, in your data center? Cool, right? Well, to install it on Linux, it's pretty easy. It's already there, right? <laughs> so, but I do wanna call out something actually serious, it's being funny. Uh, is it depends on distribution and the configuration of that SSH daemon, right? So Red Hat has certain conditions in which it's configured by default. Ubuntu configures it in a certain way. I'm a big Red Hat CentOS person. And so out of the box, if you do the minimal install on RHEL or CentOS, you get SSH and you get it open to the world with the firewall and you get root login remotely, which potentially is bad news depending on your security profile. So just know that that's what you're gonna get out of the box functionality on the Linux side of the house. I believe Ubuntu disables uh, remote login for root, and I believe root actually has no password by default, but we can talk about Ubuntu offline. 
Have you guys seen that meme with the guys from like West Coast Choppers, right? The thing with like the five different boxes and they're arguing about, they're arguing about FreeBSD versus Ubuntu. And the, the last thing, <laughs> the last thing is, you know, the guy throwing the chair and it's like, why don't you at get yourself a real OS, right? <laughs> so I got a lot of respect for the FreeBSD world, uh, but I operate mostly in the CentOS world. So it's time to install OpenSSH. I have a test lab here. It's a remoting session, so we're gonna be jumping around a lot between various systems. So if you get confused or I do a poor job telling you which system I'm on, just raise your hand and be like, what are you doing, no Centino? Uh, I have a domain controller. I have a, work, a Linux managed workstation, which is where we'll drive most of our demos from. I have a Linux server just sitting there uh, and also a Windows box that we're gonna work with. So we'll jump over here and get going. Hold on, let me get these updates done. Do you guys mind? No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So, <laughs> let's see. Ah, there we go. Okay, so I wrote, just pulled together some quick PowerShell scripts to make this easy and predictable uh, from an installation standpoint. Normally, you can just grab it from the URL at this location. I used a version that came out about uh, a new version came out about two weeks ago uh, that changed some functionality, but I kind of wanted to keep my demos stable and I didn't take that new code. And so there is a newer version than that available. Uh, so you can download it, but I'm cheating and I'm keeping it local because I don't want to rely on the Wi-Fi. I'm using F8 for the demo. And, oops, sorry about that. Get that out of the way. If anybody knows how to shorten a PowerShell prompt, please tell me how. Uh, so we're gonna take that, we're gonna install it in this directory by default. We're gonna stick it in program files. When the SSH daemon extracts and launches for the first time, it's actually gonna put its information, its keys, its logs, and things like that, and its configuration files in percent program data percent SSH, and we'll look at that a little bit later today. So let's go ahead and extract that archive, run this beautiful PowerShell script that's gonna do the heavy lifting for us, and we'll have OpenSSH installed just like that. Pretty straightforward, this is gonna be on this Windows target, a 2016 machine. We now have SSH installed. We have the SSH daemon and the SSH agent, which is gonna allow us to hold uh, things like keys and things like that in a runtime space. I'm gonna add a firewall rule. There's no uh, new net firewall rule as far as I know in PowerShell core, so I am cheating on my demo and using 5.1, so don't tell anybody. See, don't tell anyone. So let's go ahead and run that code to open up that port. Yay, firewall ports. So, when you do this installation, it's not running by default, so we have to turn it on. Straightforward stuff. Let's go ahead and set the service as automatic. We'll set the agent as automatic. We'll start the service. And since I want to know if it's actually running and up and, and going, we use netstat minus BANO, it'll tell us the protocol, the listening address is 22, it's that it's actually in the state listening and the process ID, and then obviously the IPv6 address, because everybody loves colons. Right? <laughs> so that's it, man. It's as simple as that to get OpenSSH on a Windows server. Uh, pretty exciting functionality in this cross-platform world that we live in. So let's talk about getting users on our server. Right? So now it's installed. Now we need to talk about authentication, right? I want to get people onto these boxes securely such that I can control who has access to stuff, right? And we're going to talk about authentication methods. And this can be a common uh, tripping point for folks in configuring and managing SSH systems. And so we'll kind of go through the lineage of what you have available to us. So GSS API, Generic Security Services API, Kerberos. But this isn't the Kerberos that you're thinking of. This isn't like AD authenticating the users from on the system. This is Kerberos being authenticated by the SSH daemon itself. We'll talk about how AD works in a second. Host-based authentication. So I can say host A and host B trust each other and without, with host-based authentication, they're able to exchange information without usernames and passwords or, thing, or keys or things like that. Public and private key pairs, right? I can generate a public and private key pair. I can have the private key locally, the public key locally, put the public key on the remote system, and I can log into that system using that as an authentication method. When it comes to public and private key authentication, most people don't put a password on their private key, which means you get this thing called passwordless authentication, which is great, you don't have to have a password. But if you put a password on that key, you now have two-factor authentication, right? Something you have and something you know, and you didn't have to pay a software vendor a million dollars to do that, right? So with uh, 
The other thing with public and private key carriers, I made this joke yesterday. Uh, when I was a PhD student, my advisor came from the University of New Hampshire to the University of Mississippi, where we did a lot of grid computing work, hundreds of servers and all these things like that. He had an 11-year-old private key with no password, right? Not good news. And he used that key on all of the systems, right? These are hundreds of boxes with this one simple key, right? So if this thing gets compromised, that's bad news. So people often will generate one key and distribute that. That's not a good idea. So take the time, generate keys for maybe, I don't wanna say for each individual system, but in a way that you're kind of controlling the surface area that you expose if your key gets compromised, right? Challenge and response, so actual two-factor authentication, key fobs and things like that are available to you, and then passwords. Everybody loves passwords, right? One of the things about SSH uh, is it's called password authentication, but it's actually a poor name for the functionality that it provides. When OpenSSH is gonna do password authentication, what it's actually doing is handing the authentication request off to the underlying OS for it to authenticate the user. Not, it's not actually doing that itself. So this is where AD Auth comes in, right? When we configure the underlying operating environment to participate in AD authentication, we configure password authentication. The user request comes in over SSH, hands it off to the underlying operating environment. The operating environment decides, is this a local request or is it an AD request? And they'll send it to the right place. And we're gonna configure this today together in a demo so you guys see how that works. The other thing to know is that this list is processed in this order by default, right? Your default configuration in SSH will define this order of authentication. So you'll literally see like an authentication failure request for Kerberos, fail. You'll see the key request, uh, fail. You'll, and it'll go down to password authentication if you're not using a public key. Uh, and so that could be interesting. You, like, you might wanna think that I'm gonna remove password authentication because all my users are using keys. Well, if that's the case and your key breaks, then you can't get in, right? Because you don't have another method to get into the system if that is uh, not functional anymore. So let's talk about authenticating users. We dabbled with this just a second ago. We talked about uh, users being authenticated by the underlying operating environment. So we have local user databases, right, on Windows and Linux. You have Etsy password and the shadow password file that authenticates users locally on Linux systems. And you guys have that similar concept in Windows, right, that local account database, I think SAM or something like that. We have AD, which can be configured on both Windows and Linux. For Windows to configure AD auth over SSH, you do nothing. You join, you install SSH, you join a domain and you get AD auth. That's pretty cool, out of the box. But remember, the functionality of AD is pretty cool in that we get both user lookup via LDAP and we get Kerberos authentication via AD, or the functionality that it provides for both user and host authentication, right? Guaranteeing, again, guaranteeing that that host is who it is. Uh, so back in the day, before, uh, wait, let me tell this story in a second. Yeah, I'll hold on to that one for a second. So, uh, Windows, Linux, yeah, so we talked about Windows. And the Linux side of the house, we have to do a little bit of work, and it's gotten significantly easier than it was back in the day when it comes to AD auth for users. We have this thing called SSSD, or the System Security Services Daemon. You install this, you join a domain, it's one line, it's, it's one command that you have to execute, and you'll have AD auth. And what happens is, under the hood, SSSD will determine, is the user local, or is the user remote, and hand, a request, and hand that authentication request off to the correct authenticating body, whether it's the local account database or AD, and you do nothing. Back when I had to do this, I had to like walk both ways you know, to school uphill in the snow, configuring Kerberos, configuring LDAP, adding POSIX attributes to, the AD, to AD, such that we have user IDs and group IDs, and now it's just, it just works, and it's awesome. So we have this now as a way to uh, I guess you could say, identify that as an a authentication request that has to get passed off to a domain. So you have this kind of funny syntax where it's the username at the domain name at the host name, right? So aen at lab.satinosystems.com, which is my Active Directory, and we have at the host name, which is the machine that I want to authenticate against. So you can shorten this and get rid of that with some configuration, but out of the box, simple stuff. I think this is still pretty cool that we have this functionality. If that bothers you a lot, you can also use aliases on your SSH clients to shorten this up such that you can just literally type a single character and log into your things. So let's do some stuff with Authenticate. We're gonna do some user keys because that's always a common tripping point for folks. I wanna walk through how to generate a key, distribute a key, and things like that. We're gonna configure AD Auth together and then we're gonna combine them together and see how that works. Hmm. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Like, ask why am I using this Windows machine, right? 
because Macs only have 16 gigs of freaking RAM in them nowadays, <laughs> right? Although that's kind of, we're kind of spoiled that I'm complaining that I can only get 16 gigs of RAM in a certain in a machine, right? Okay, so we installed PowerShell already, we did that. We're gonna generate some keys. So, I'm gonna generate a key for me, key gen. And it's gonna generate in my home directory, in that .ssh directory, and it's gonna put a file, the, uh, the private key, id underscore rsa. By default, I can call that whatever, potato.pub, anything. I'm not gonna give it a password, and we'll see that it generates those two files on my system, id underscore rsa, and then id underscore rsa.pub. Pub is the one that goes to the remote system. Right, right now, I'm still on my local system, CentOS dash W1, the workstation. I'm gonna take that key and I'm gonna distribute it to the server. So SSH copy ID is how we're gonna do that. Okay. Sir. Do you have your system already on This workstation is not. The server will be in a few minutes when we do that together. Cool. So SSH copy ID. <coughs> Excuse me. This is part of the standard open SSH distribution, right? One of the most challenging, I'm gonna say most challenging things, but the thing that is challenging for people is distributing keys to remote hosts. This does the heavy lifting for you from Linux to Linux systems. What happens under the hood is this is a bash script that will copy that file through the remote system, set the permissions correctly on a directory that has to land in, put it in the right place, and get your authentication configured for you. This does not exist on Windows yet. Feel free, I, I wanna do it, go to the GitHub project and maybe make the cross-platform version of this and submit it as a pull request. I imagine they would be quite appreciative of that. I did demo yesterday, and I'll put this on the internet for you guys, is effectively what needs to occur. I'm not gonna do it today, but if I need to copy a key to a Windows system, this is what needs to occur from a permission standpoint to make everything work on the remote system. We're gonna talk about the theory about why that's the case, but this is the code to make it work on Windows. If you wanna go through that together, I'll be glad to show you guys, but I'm not planning to demo that right now because I did it yesterday and I want to show you other stuff. So let's execute this. Copy that key to the remote host. I'm gonna accept that host key for the foreign server because I trust that server because I built it. I wouldn't trust that server for you guys if I built it, but that uh, is gonna be what I will use for subsequent connections to authenticate that remote host, right? Every time I log into that system, it's gonna give me that key. I'm gonna look in the, no, the list of known hosts on my system. If they match, yay, I know who that system is, right? So right now, we have to use password auth, because we have to auth to that system, put the key in the right spot, or create the folder, put it in the right spot, set the permissions. That's what's happening under the hood. So now we can go and, all right, there's this thing, there's a caching daemon on Linux systems. It's a complete pain in the butt. And I'll tell you right now, I turn it off and kill it, SSH agent minus K. If I hit enter right now and I get challenged for a password, I'm gonna be so frustrated, because this is, it's been works all the time, except this morning when I practiced this demo. Yes. All right, cool. I got it. So what the copy ID did is it created that directory just a few minutes ago. I'm on central time, so you can see it's 1121. It creates it with the right permissions, right? So AEN, AEN. That file's actually getting dropped down by SSH, right? If you're familiar with how uh, permissions work on Linux, that would actually be written by root, but then it changes it to AEN and sets the permissions such that it's only read, write, and execute. Right? What we really wanna have happen here is have it be that it's not world readable or group readable. We need to secure this thing so that people can't compromise the key, potentially. That's a facility called strict mode, so then, which um, is a default configuration in the SSH daemon. You can turn off strict mode, but I don't advise that, but that's the permission set that's needed. That's what that other PowerShell code does on the Windows environment with the iCackle stuff at the bottom of this demo if you guys wanna to toy with that on your own time. So we logged in, local user, you can see I'm logged in just AEN, so let's get out. So on Windows, right, we set up Windows together just a few minutes ago, we installed SSH, and now I'm gonna AD auth into that domain joined Windows system, right, so Windows S1. And literally all you need to do is this less dramatic when I can't copy and paste fast, right? MBS code. So yes, it's the first time I'm logging into that Windows box. I'm gonna accept that key. It's gonna put it in my local known hosts file. I am now logged into the system with the domain account. Literally installed SSH, join a domain, that's it. No additional configuration needed. So, 
that's going to be a, just a command uh, shell. We're going to do remoting in a minute at the end. So time for uh, configuring AD. We're going to do that right now. So these are all the things that you need to configure AD, right? So we're going to do sudo yum install realm D, Kerberos workstation 5, odd job, you know, the guy with the hat from the Bond movies, odd job make homedir, which you're going to see what the functionality of that is in about two seconds, SSHD, or SSHD, SSSD, which is the security services daemon, and some, Samba, and some Samba libraries that we need. Let's go ahead and copy this, paste it down. It's a <laughs> typing very fast. Not in the shell script. In a PowerShell script, you can. Yeah, see, I'm running shell, not PowerShell. Yeah, yeah. I know. I, I was, like, thinking about that, too, when I was practicing the demos. So I totally did that against the wrong system. Hold on. <laughs> so there we go. Sir. So that's so what we got. CentOS-S1. On the server side, we're doing this on. Yes, Max? I would, uh, I don't know if the package names are exact, uh, an exact match, but one, like, just go and make sure what the package names, if they match up. So I cheated. I actually installed this earlier because I didn't want to rely on conference, conference Wi-Fi, so it just says everything was already installed, right? So when you log into the right server and you install the right software, and all you need to do is this, sudo realm join, the domain you want to join, minus capital U, the join user, so this would be a user in the domain that has the ability to create a computer account, because that's what's going to happen under the hood here, and minus V, because I like output and text and verbose, verbose stuff, verbose. Is that like an alternative to Kerberos? Right? So it's going to join the domain, and it's going to do a lot of stuff, right? Like, literally, I had to walk both hills up way to school. And this is done. I'm in the domain. I have AD auth now. That's cool, right? And what happens under the hood is it does a lot of stuff. It creates the Kerberos conf file and the key tabs. It does all that stuff for you. It configures NS. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through each of the individual config files, but if you guys want to go spelunking through these things, you can. Uh, it configures NS switch, which is the thing that's going to say, am I going to authenticate you against the local databases or the remote database, AD, right? And then SSSD, which is the thing that actually does the routing. And I have the ability to do this. I'm going to use the command ID. I'm going to say id aen at lab.centinosystems.com, and I'm going to ask the domain for the POSIX user attributes for this particular user, right? So you can see I get back my user ID, my username, my uh, default group ID, domain users, and any of the groups that I'm a member of, right? So now, like yesterday in the demos, I configured SSH to restrict uh, authentication into the SSH server to that particular group, right? So combining that together with disable and root login, you've already increased your security profile of your SSH server significantly because you're controlling it, who can get in and disable and root access, right? With an AD group, that's simply an AD group, nothing special about it. So let's go ahead and try logging in. At CentOS dash S1, so I'm on CentOS W1, AD auth into the remote system, fingers crossed. And I'm logged in. It, and so we can see that odd jobs job is to create the home directory for this particular user because that didn't exist in the local system when we, because uh, we didn't actually have to like, configure the user at all, right? It just works. So it creates that directory and we're logged into the domain. Pretty cool stuff, pretty simple to do with a couple of commands. So let's go ahead and back out of here and combine key-based auth with AD auth, right? And I want you guys to think about what's happening with the user being authenticated or the user being validated and the request actually being authenticated. So we'll go through that together. So copy ID. How about I just copy that? Yeah. So that's taking the key that we generated for this user on my local system and sticking it in the AD auth user that we just, we just set up. And so if I do SSH minus V, if you're having any trouble with authentication on SSH, SSH minus V, and you're gonna get this. I'll show you right now. 
mental note, make shorter domain names for demos. All right. So minus V gets you verbose output. All right. And so you can see I'm already logged in, no password, because I didn't put a password on the key. What I do want to call out is what's happening under the hood when I do SSH minus V. All right. I, back, 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 back. Connect to the server, connection established. Scroll down, skip over that. We authenticate the system, right? Doing the host key authentication against what key is found in a known host file. It presents to me its key. I compare it with the keys in my local host, my local known host file at that location. Number one, there's only one key in there, and it's the first, well, there's two keys now because of the Windows box. But that's gonna be the, you could say, the numeric index into which key that is. So if you do have an error, and it's like keys 37 is wrong, you can literally go down to line 37, delete that key, and get a new one next time you log in. But question, why did the key change? Don't just accept that automatically, right? And so, so after the, uh, the host is authenticated, we move into the user authentication phase. So like I said, you're gonna see Kerberos, right? GSS API go first, and it's gonna fail. And then we're gonna move into passing on our public key, right? And it's gonna compare that to the local copy of our private key, and it's gonna hopefully allow me in. And so we can see we're authenticated via uh, public key authentication. So, uh, two different facilities. Who asked the question? Uh, so I've actually never configured GSS API in a production system. I've only done it with AD and Kerberos. Even years ago, I was using AD and Kerberos because setting that up out of the box is a complete pain in the butt uh, with the default configuration, sir. It is now, right? Um, yes, because of Kerberos is effectively is the real reason, right? Because it's gonna, it's, when Kerberos, not only does it authenticate the user, but it authenticates the two systems participating in the authentication, right? So if we go and we look at, so this guy is gonna participate in the conversation as a computer, right? And that's gonna be authenticating the system in the domain. All right, so I wanted to show you, I copied the key, and I totally just got discombobulated. I have authorized keys, combined key off, oh, yeah, yeah, so here we go. Oh, yeah, so I got ahead of myself in the demos. That's why I'm confused. So let me go ahead and remove SSH, authorize keys, and back out. Because I wanted to show you guys what happens with AD, right? AD authentication, you know, it passes Kerberos, the, the system-specific Kerberos, passes the public key, and it, it becomes, it is a password off, because in other words, like I said, it's handing it off the underlying operating environment to authenticate the user. So that's the point there. Back out of that. Give me that back. So we'll need that for subsequent demos. Okay. How am I doing on time, Richard? Good. Thank you, sir. Okay. So setting up uh, PowerShell remoting on Windows and Linux. I can do what? Uh, so I did this video with Jeffrey Snover and Jason Helmick about a year and a half ago, almost two years. And the way that this goes down is in like June or July of 2016, Don Jones sends me an email. He's like, hey, I need a Linux guy. I'm like, cool, that's me. And he's like, I need you to do something. I'm like, what? He's like, I can't, I can't tell you. I'm like, oh, okay. And so, sounds great. I'll get involved in that, because Don said so, right? And everybody knows what that means when Don says so. So he's like, you're gonna work with this guy named Jason Helmick. I'm like, who's Jason Helmick? Google, Google, Google. Oh, cool, all right. So I get on a conference call with Jason, and Jason's like, you're gonna do this thing with me and this guy, Jeffrey Snover. I'm like, who's Jeffrey Snover? Google, Google, Google. I'm like, oh, okay, that guy. And, and so, I was like, that's pretty cool, you know, and so he's like, but we need you to, you know, like, have this conversation with us and shoot this six-hour training video and talk, be, have a meaningful conversation about PowerShell, and before that video, I was, like, the copy and paste PowerShell guy, right? I'd go to the Googles, and I'd be like, oh, there, I need that, copy, paste, edit, 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 run, right? And so I had to crawl in a hole and learn PowerShell in six weeks that I can sit at the table and shoot a six-hour training video with those two guys, right? Which was a little intimidating. I had to explain to my wife, I'm like, yeah, I'm like in Cancun, I'm like, PowerShell, yeah, on vacation. But long story short is during that demo, or during that shoot, 
in between two scenes, um, Jeffrey and I are having a conversation about this whole concept of like fan out remoting, being able to uh, execute a command on many systems with one single line of code, right? Like invoke command, dash computer name, and a big bucket of computer names, and it goes and does that. And he's explaining to me the plumbing behind how that works with asynchronous job posting and all that stuff. And I'm like, dude, that's freaking cool. And I paused and I high-fived him. I'm like, that's awesome, right? And so since then, I've taken PowerShell really seriously and it's become a big part of how I manage systems, because simply because of that particular thing with fan out remoting. And before this conversation, uh, the night before, I'd never even heard of DSC, right? And the night before, Jason and I are at the bar at the Marriott down the street and we're going, he's showing me how DSC works and the concepts and things like that. I'm like, oh, that's cool. So if you watch this video, you'll actually see me on the side taking notes while they're talking about DSC, right? Because there's stuff that I want to apply to situations that I have to deal with, even on Linux systems. So which is pretty cool to, to get that. So a lot of value for me as a Linux guy to learn like what's going on and the things that you guys have been using for years, right? So very exciting stuff. So let's talk about how we're gonna bring PowerShell remoting together with the underlying stuff that we just all went through, right? We just built up to the point where we have the ability to run SSH on Windows systems and of course the Linux systems, right? So we're gonna focus on server-side configuration. We have the ability to do client-side configuration, things like aliases and stuff like that I covered yesterday, but we're gonna focus on server-side configuration and we have to be able to bring together PowerShell, the, the program, and SSH, the underlying substrate or transport layer. And on Linux systems, that configuration is going to live in Etsy, SSH, SSHD underscore config. There is an SSH underscore config file. That is for client settings. We're going to focus predominantly on SSHD, which is the server side or daemon settings, right? On Windows systems, that file lives in percent program data percent, right? That we talked about a little bit ago when we start up the SSH daemon for the first time. It's going to put its logs and its information inside that directory. Sir? This is where we are right now, like today, if I went and did this. I don't know the case for the, uh, if I use the GitHub project, this is what's gonna happen. Um, I know Joey, you talked about the potential changes and things like that, so yeah, it's entirely possible that this moves to some other location at some time in the future, but if you do this tonight, you're gonna get that. So that lives there uh, in sshd underscore config on Windows systems in the SSH directory. Uh, logs get written to there now, which changed, which I'll talk about in a second. And um, your host keys live here as well. Sir? You mean the drop down config files? Yeah, so um, this is like the big difference between, I would say big difference, but this is the fundamental difference between Windows admins and Linux admins, right? Not that I'm un undermining any of what you say. But that's no big deal, right? For me to copy a file to a target system, that's like totally standard practice. Or for me to drop a line into that remotely with like setter awk, that's totally standard foo for us, right? Yeah. But um, so I'm happy to see that, but you guys are like, why isn't it in the registry, right? That kind of stuff. So that's just not <laughs> how we roll. <laughs> yeah, look, so. Um, logging, logging, logging. All right, I forget, I'm getting a little bit confused between yesterday's session and today's session. In the latest version of PowerShell or uh, the OpenSSH project that just came out last week, the one that I did not upgrade to, upgrade to uh, conventionally your logs will land in a text file in this directory, right? They just changed it such that the stuff defaults into ETW, which lands in your event log, which is convenient for you guys, right? But I'd rather have it in a text file. No offense. So PowerShell core and subsystems. This is how we're gonna bring this stuff together, right? We're gonna go and configure PowerShell core such that it can talk to OpenSSH. Actually, really, it's the other way around, but whatever. In that SSHD configuration file, you have the keyword subsystem. You name the subsystem something, in this case it's PowerShell, and then you point it to a binary, right? So in this case it's gonna be C, program files, PowerShell, uh, yada, 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 to, all the way to pwsh.exe. Those parameters on the right are actually PowerShell parameters, and that then is now a configured subsystem, such that when I come along and you do something like enter PS session, What's gonna happen in the SSH request that's built underneath is I'm gonna drop in the fact that I wanna switch the channel to a subsystem, right, which is then gonna spawn a PowerShell process on a remote system, gonna connect the standard streams of the two processes together over SSH, and that's literally how data goes to and fro, right? Had me nervous there, I thought you were raising your hand again. <laughs> All right, 
So pretty easy stuff, like standard streams is, is a normal paradigm for a way that for Unix systems to do inter-process communication. This just happens that we're, pl we're plugging the two together over an SSH connection, right? Which is really cool from the PowerShell standpoint because now they don't have to deal with the plumbing anymore, right? That's all built in stuff in the SSH, right? And that your security people won't have a cow and you're like, let's turn on WinRM. Let's not, let's use SSH, right? And they're probably gonna be cool with that. So there, this is the Windows world. Uh, if I needed to go and configure PowerShell core plus SSH to get remoting over SSH. Uh, but it, you have to deal with this per platform, right? And so who notices the big difference between those two lines of text, right? One's got slashes to the left, the other has slashes to the right. For whatever reason, I should have, the two, those developers were here yesterday, I should have asked them. Uh, is in the config file, slashes to the right, even though it's a Windows path, right? And you guys aren't used to this kind of, this concept with slashes to the left. So if you copy and paste this and you put it in that file, you're gonna be sad because it's not gonna work, right? Do, and make sure you put the uh, slashes in what I would call the correct direction. If you're on a Mac, PWSH lives there. If you're on a Linux system, PWSH lives there. So just simply substitute that out. The parameters are still the same because those are PowerShell parameters that get passed into the uh, PowerShell executable. The USR or bin is generally a symlink to USR bin. Don't be confused. It's literally the same path on your system. It's just that conventionally over the years, there's been a divergence between slash bin and USR bin. So let's talk about, let's do that. Build subsystems and stuff. We are gonna go to the Windows box. Log in, jump over to here, the third demo, and do this. See, I took advantage of F8 there. Hey. We're gonna add a subsystem, copy and paste, right, because I don't wanna type during demos, because it's gonna be brutal. One thing that I've noticed, if you've noticed, this is built in here, right? That can be troublesome over time if we change out versions of PowerShell or a feature because right? then you can control exactly which version you're using, depending on how you view that glass is half empty, glass is half full, right? So if we go down a little bit, oh, uh, sorry for the font size business, I didn't even think about that, font, bang, bang. If you see this, this is a default configuration, right? It specifies that, but it's commented out, but that's the default value, so that you can go and you can see what the default configuration parameters are for SSH. If it's not commented out, then it's gonna be explicitly defined. So if we scroll down a little bit here, there's another subsystem that lives there, and we're just gonna, there's no real reason to put that there. You can literally stick this anywhere other than the fact that it's just nice to have it in the same place, right? So SFTP is another subsystem. We're gonna define that subsystem. We're gonna save this out. We are gonna bump our SSH daemon to read that config and we are gonna jump over to, uh, back to the workstation and test out our remoting capabilities. I am in PowerShell core now, 6.1, and I'm going to try to connect to that system. And I'm gonna get an error. So you're gonna see this, the first time you do it, probably it's gonna try to use WinRM, right, out of the box because the positional parameter for enter PS session is dash computer name, right? If we don't put anything in there, I think. So we can have to tell uh, Powers or enter PS session that we want to use SSH, right, under the hood. So let's go ahead and do that. And then we get logged in. And so now this connection purely running over SSH, which I think is pretty darn cool. There is another parameter in the universe of enter PS session now, dash host name, which by default, will just work because now it knows to use SSH as the underlying transport for that. Now, let's do AD auth, right? Again, no configuration to make this happen other than what we've done so far, joining domain and putting SSH on there. So I'm back on the workstation and I'm about to connect to that Windows-S1 by simply defining the username. And this is all facilitated by OpenSSH under the hood and PowerShell remoting on top and I get exactly what I want on the remote system. Now, uh, before someone asked uh, what shell do I get, now I get PowerShell, right, I said PS. Okay. 
And we are going to do this. Now we're going to connect to enter PS session. We're going to connect to the host name, CentOS S1, and give it our AD auth user, AD auth user, because we just configured AD authentication together, and I get an error. Why is that? The SSH client has ended the error message. Subsystem request failed on channel zero, right? Because I haven't gone into the SSHD configuration on the remote box and said, let's use a subsystem, right? Because what happens is SSH just tries to do it uh, to call invoke the PowerShell subsystem, and it cannot. So let's make that config change together. Oops. I want that line of code. I'm going to log in reg over regular SSH. Edit this config file. Oops, sorry. Pseudo VI. See, good. I didn't just log in as root. You want to you maintain like good security practices? This bums me out. Control F, like it doesn't work the way that I would expect on, because Control F is page down on non Windows keyboards. But I have a page down key for the first time in 20 years. It's kind of nice. All right. Let's go ahead and drop this line in right here. We're just adding a subsystem to bin PWSH. Our PowerShell core is already installed. All that heavy lifting has occurred. I got, I got. Write that out. Systems, yeah, or too much coffee, let's be serious. Restart SSHD, throw a pseudo on the front. Bang out, we'll go to Control D, logs out. I don't know if you ever used that bash shortcut. That's awesome. Back out, up arrow, up arrow, enter. And I get right in, right? So now we run PowerShell remoting. I can do all this cool stuff that, what is it, PS, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, just to prove to you guys, is it? So that's the, this is the PowerShell process is going to be dangling off of SSH. That's going to interpret all of our commands on, for us, right? It's the job of the subsystem to kick this off on the remote box. Troubleshooting open SSH. Let's get into that. Or why doesn't this work, right? There's one way that I, you're going to troubleshoot this, right? Is you're going to make sure that SSH works, right? Just take remoting out of the picture. Make sure that you can log into that system, get a shell, and then bring remoting into the picture and troubleshoot whatever your issue is. We've already used the minus V parameter. Use that, learn that authentication model, right? Host is first, all the various authentication models that you're using for user auth and things like that. You have the ability to do service ID debug. This is actually extremely helpful when things get dicey, but you have to have control of the remote system to be able to do this, right? So we can go into our SSHD config, we can modify the debug level, we can ramp it up to debug three, which is going to be a vomitorium of text. And you're going to get, in SSHD, it's going to, up until that previous version, would spit it out into, the, into uh, program data, percent program data percent uh, in the log file in there in the SSH directory or in var log messages, no, var log SSH on Linux systems. And it will literally tell you what's wrong. Uh, for example, when I was prepping the demos, uh, I had strict modes enabled. And I'm like, why isn't my key-based authentication working? for that Windows box, right? And all you get on the client side, even with like 17 Vs after, on the client side, when you launch the SSH client, it's just gonna tell you your, your key failed authentication, and it's gonna ask you for a password. I cranked up debug three, restarted the SSH daemon on the Windows box. It's like, oh, this security identifier has read access to this particular directory in your thing because of strict modes, your auth failed. It's that explicit. So go in there and look at that and it'll tell you what's wrong if things are getting dicey. Uh, there's some good docs there on the methods on how to do that, so you don't have to rely on me just blabbing about it. You can actually go and read that stuff to get that going. Live, oh, here's that line that I was trying to find. Currently lives in the log files, but moved to ETW in the latest rev, and then they talk about that there, so there's good commentary on that. So common problems that you'll have outside of like how we would go troubleshooting this is host key mismatch is a big one, right? Something changed, and I get it presented with a new key, and your, fun your, your uh, authentication will just fail, because that's gonna happen first. That's the very first thing that occurs is that host key exchange. So if that changed, figure out why before you go and accept that new key, and then figure out if you want to accept that new key. This is always a big problem. It was my problem on the Windows side of the house, because I just didn't quite understand what I needed to have happen. Uh, 
when it came to setting that up, and I'll use that technique to figure it out. Subsystem, we did that, right? It's pretty explicit. I think that's a newer thing, because when I first started dabbling with this, you didn't get such a nice error that was like, um, you didn't configure the subsystem before, it would just, I think, just give you nothing, which is bad news. Uh, yeah, and the PowerShell client will yell at you when you try to do things without a subsystem. So uh, I'm not gonna be in 403, I'm gonna sit in the corner over there until Richard's done, but we can hang out and have some questions after, I'm gonna hand it off to him in a second. There's my contact info again, and I have Pluralsight courses, free access up here, so if you wanna have, like, go into deeper detail about the different features and functionality of OpenSSH and how to do that, that's all available to you guys there. So cool, any questions? What's that? I, can we put that on the website? We can do. You can? I yep. put the PowerPoint there. I have to get, I'll zip yep. the code up and put yeah, it there. You can put the, you I had intended to, but. Put the code up as well. All right, we'll go from left to right here. Go. So the, there's a keyword in SSHD config that's called allow groups, right? And all I, literally, it's this easy. Allow groups, then it's gonna be the group at the domain name. So we'll just say, like, my user was a member of SSH users when I did the ID command. Simply put that there, because remember, you're asking the underlying operating system to do that work for you. So all that's really gonna happen under the hood is Unix and Linux systems don't have a concept of, like, security identifier with, like, the big, long alphanumeric, blah, 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 that you guys use. We just simply turn them into integers. So I'm gonna go and, and resolve that group ID, and it's just gonna be a number. And if you're in that group, then you get in. And so that's all happening by the underlying operating environment. Uh, question, is that Allow groups? Yeah. It should, I gotta tell you, I haven't, I haven't tried it, but I can't see why it wouldn't. For that same concept of just evaluate, like resolving it to a uni uh, the group, and if you are in that group or not. We can do that afterwards, we'll try it out. Sir. Yes, by default, out of the box it is. Yeah, and that's one of the things I struggled with configuring that demo. Um, with Remember, I, I didn't demo it today, but I have the code in there with the iCackle stuff. That was a total pain, yeah, so, yes. I'm not quite to understand the exact intent. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. So you're talking about like in a local, in a, in a system where I'd have a local. Right, and they're gonna, yes, if the, so theoretically yes, if the group, if the number matches, you'll get access to the resource. Because all Unix cares about is if the two numbers match, right? It doesn't matter what, it could. So I'm not an AD ninja, but it's my understanding that when in newer versions of the AD schema, post six attributes are included, so that user ID and group ID, yeah, is gonna be a value that's for that particular user in your AD. So I would, if you, as long as the, if you have the ability to change that user, I would probably change it in AD before I changed it in. Cool. Okay, one more, because I'm totally in the red zone in time. Yes. So if you didn't need a train app, the whole bunch of other scripts would be different, so then you'll have to figure out magic. Right, um, yes, so we do, no, it's not PowerShell, PowerShell, of course. Okay, let's do this, and then you can't read that. Uh, It's in there. There's like, it's literally like key transport or something like that. <laughs> Trust me, because I'm up here. Not, not there it is. Uh, key file path. So it's all you, sir. Okay. My name is Richard Sidaway, director of PowerShell.org. I'm responsible for the 
uh, part of the organization of the summit. If there's anything that you liked about the summit, please come and tell me. If there's anything you don't like, please go and tell Don, because that was his fault. Um, I've been, been a PowerShell MVP for 10, year, 10 years. I've uh, been working with PowerShell since V1. How many people were working with V1, PowerShell? Yeah? All we had for remoting was get to be my object. Yeah, wasn't that fun? And then along came remoting. <clears throat> and what I'm going to cover in this session was two goals. One is to think a little bit about troubleshooting techniques, and in specifically talking about troubleshooting PowerShell remoting. It's enabled by default, so a lot of the installed problems go away. And before that, it was just enabled PS remoting. And the servers have got it already, network connections can be a pain, and you've got to enable it on the client OSs and the older servers. And it usually just works if you're in the domain. But how many of you have been troubleshooting remoting ever? You love the error messages? Aren't they wonderful? In terms of travel, troubleshooting methodologies, over the years, I found it tend to fall into two groups. It's the guy who sits there going, this will work. Da, 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 da. <laughs> you will be pressured in to do this because your manager will be coming, what's wrong, what's wrong, fix it, fix it, fix it. Usually it's quicker if you've got a methodical set of tests that you can work through and uh, you fix the problem. So when I was thinking about this talk, because um, originally it was just going to be troubleshooting, remoting, but then I thought, we'll put a bit of methodology around it. So how can I get a methodology around troubleshooting? If you've dug into the commandlets that come, there is some troubleshooting commandlets, but they came in Windows 7, I think, and they've not changed then, and they're not really extensible. So I had a few beers, and I thought about it, and I had a few more beers, and I thought about it, and I had a few more beers, and then eventually I remembered that we got Pester. So I've set up some tests in Pester to use as a troubleshooting thing. So I'm going to show you how that works and put it forward as a troubleshooting technique that you may or may not want to adopt. A few obvious tests when you're testing remoting. Um, is it your machine? Can you connect to another machine? Can you actually get across the network? Is WSMAN there? So what I'm going to do is show pester-based methodology. Um, it doesn't have every possible test in because we'd be here till Christmas. Um, I'm just showing some options and some methods um, just to get you thinking about it. And we'll be looking at things like the impact of taking down the WinRM service, what happens if you break the listeners and ports, endpoints, firewalls. So I'm basically going to break remoting and then show you how to troubleshoot it. The one thing I'm not really going to cover apart from this slide is PowerShell Direct. How many of you use that? How many of you know what it is? OK. PowerShell Direct is for Windows 10 and Server 2016, Hyper-V hosts and clients. And you're remoting over the VM bus rather than WSMAN or SSH. So in the session command lets and invoke command, you've got a V name, um, which uses the virtual machine name, or you've got a VM ID parameter, which is used as this GUID. Um, which one you want to type, I'll leave up to you, but I use the name. And if you get an error with PowerShell Direct, it's usually one of two things. Either you've put your credentials in wrong, or your path has been screwed up, and PowerShell X PowerShell.exe is not on the path on your VM, and it can't find it. I think that's it for slides. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Do you want to see some code? Yeah. Oh, God. You, you keep making me work. OK. Usual nags at the top of my demo to remember to start the um, things that I want to use. 
Okay, when we're, re when we're remoting, if you've had problems with remoting, the error messages are not the most helpful. That's about the politest way I can put it. And what's worse is if, and I noticed this when I was going through the, um, setting this up, the error messages that you get don't always match what's in the documentation. So there's an about troubleshooting remoting or about remoting troubleshooting or whatever it is. That's out of date, uh, which confused me. It doesn't take much, but that did confuse me. And so we, at this point, we're assuming that the network connectivity exists and has been checked. I'm not going to cover the double hop problem. Does everybody know what that is? Anybody not know what it is? Good. Sorry. You don't know what the double hop problem is. OK. Double hop problem is a classic remoting issue. I'm on my box here. I want to remote to this box here. That all works. And then when on the remote session, I try to remote to another box over here, and it fails. And it's because of the Kerberos, the way Kerberos works, it won't allow you to, by default, to delegate your credentials to that second box so that you can connect to the third box. The way that most people get around it is to use credit SSP. There's a few issues with that. Ashley McGlone did a session last year, which I think we managed to get it recorded, but it's covered in his blog posts. Um, he's got some very, very neat ways of getting around it. If you want to know more about it, come and see me afterwards, and I'll go through the issues with you. OK, so remoting should work by default. And we, whoop, no, we don't want to remove the session. And it just works, and that's what we expect. Now let's start playing with everybody's expectations. Get rid of that. What I'm doing, or what I'm going to do, is I've got a bunch of scenarios I'm going to work through. We'll see how the time goes to how many we do. But basically, I'm just going to break remoting. And the fun is that you don't know what I've done to break it. And I can't remember either. <laughs> so what I do want you to do is take note of the error messages that come up and what we do to fix those. Because you'll see that we get the same error message in a number of places where there are different causes, but you get the same error. And that's one of the things that I find confusing when I'm trying to sh troubleshoot remoting, because it could be this, or it could be that, or it could be the other. So hopefully this will help you, or this sort of concept will help you get around that. It takes a little while to fail. Come on, faster, faster. Oh, come on, it doesn't take you this long. Wake me up when this, right, thank you. Okay, so that's a lovely message. WinRM cannot complete the operation. Thank you. Okay, so. When we get to the end, I'll go through with all, what all the tests are doing. Um, I don't want to spoil the fun. Right, so WinRM should be running. Let's fix that. So if, let's start the WinRM service. What else can we do? Make a note of that error message. Let's 
Tennis. Might not be able to do it this way. There we go. Yeah, actually, it's better like that. Okay. WinRM can complete the operation. No listener. Do you all know what the listeners are? Anybody not know what the WS man listener is? That's what it's connecting to. Uh, let's show you. Actually, I can't show you because I've got rid of it. Let me put it back. Yeah, just ignore that. No, seriously, just ignore it. It. it <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a false error message. Okay, the listener is this thing, and it basically says, what transports am I going to accept, um, you know, WS Man Remoting Work Server HTTP, HTTPS, and what addresses am I going to get? Uh, so that's all right. Let's break this again. We've done that one. This time. Oh, that's good. We've got a different message. WS Man service cannot process the request. Well, that helps us. So we've got the service running, the listener's available, it's enabled, we're using HTTP, address is okay. But the endpoint doesn't exist. Okay. What we should have is a Microsoft PowerShell endpoint. That's the default endpoint that you're going to be using. So if somebody's gone in and played around and got rid of that because they thought, because they thought there's two of them and you don't really need both, um, that is why it failed. So how do I fix this? Oh, yeah. That's the same fix, enable PS remoting. That gets you out of a lot of trouble. If in doubt, try that. But sometimes the speed, if you, it's always worth just trying that rather than uh, actually going through the methodology. And oh, just need to break it again. Any questions so far? So where, is that on where is that in GitHub? <laughs> it will be available after the summit, sometime towards the end of next week. Um, I've got a choice. I can either do that for you, or I can go and see my granddaughters. You guys lose. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we got we got this another identical mer uh, error message back. What have we done this time? 
what I'm trying to show you with this is that you can get the same error messages for an awful lot of reasons. And this, this one's the firewall blocking it. Um, I don't know whether you're in the internal firewall on your machines or not. But if it's not configured properly, some bright spark from securities come around and said, oh, you don't need that. Shum. <laughs> there goes your remoting. No, it's just a matter of putting the firewall rule back on. You know when you get that helpful junior admin that goes and tries to tidy your stuff for you? Yeah, th these are the sorts of scenarios I've seen people do. Uh, and this one's probably a li little bit obvious as to why it's not going to work. Access is denied. That's this. This is this is a good one. You might think that's something to do with permissions. Yeah. You disable remoting, and you get an access denied. Which is with, which is bizarre. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah. So it's 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 giving you an, an error message that's saying your access, access is denied, which is true. But normally you think of access denied as a permissions issue, not the fact that. <laughs> yeah. I th if anybody wants anything to do, rewriting the troubleshooting remoting to actually get this uh, stuff across would be a good idea. Pardon? Uh, this, this is just a series of te pester tests running in the background, but um, it just struck me that we use PESTA for testing code and infrastructure. Why not use it for testing uh, troubleshooting? Uh, yeah. So we just force that to be enabled, and we're, we're back in business. And what are we going to do next? Yeah, you some, that, that access denied error, sometimes you'll get a connection to the remote host was refused. That, ten, that gives you a little bit more of a clue as to what it is. But I have yet to see that one actually come up uh, more than once. 99.999999% of the time, you'll get the access denied. And remember that if you've got, actually, that, that's wrong. That should be public. Oh, I must have wrote that late at night. Changing demos on the fly. All right. If you've got a public network and you try to enable PS remoting, it will throw a hissy fit at you and tell you it's not going to play. Uh, you either reset the network connection profile or you skip net, skip the check anybody want to guess what this one might be what else can we break uh, WS man can't process the request Request. I think we've seen that one before. I'll make all of these breaks and fixes and tests available so that you can you can play around with it yourselves and see what it's it's got. Uh, this is back to the endpoint. It it actually exists this time, but it's disabled. 
Uh, we'll sh show you how to fix that. Again, just enable the uh, session configuration. The one, one thing to be careful about is there's two endpoints. There's the Microsoft.PowerShell one, which is the default. If you're running on a 64-bit machine, which all the servers are, you'll also have a Microsoft.PowerShell 32, which is for anybody wanting to make a 32-bit connection. Um, if you've got people playing around on the servers that don't actually understand that you do need both of those, um, you may find that one of them disappears. So what port does remoting use? Anybody? Oh. Yeah, so by default, five and six. Um, what I've actually done is change it to 880. And then that, that works. And you can see when I run the test. It picks up that the port's different. This is when it starts to get subtle when People are changing ports on you because somebody's had a bright idea. Oh, it'll be more secure if we change the port. <laughs> You've obviously met the same security guys that I have. Does any... Sorry, I keep poking at security guys, guys but it's just I've had some interesting... Very interesting conversations with them over the years. Um, I suppose we should fix that. Because it'll confuse me if I don't. I did that in when I was practicing this. I forgot to run the fix and then tried to do the next one. And I fixed the second trouble, but I didn't fix the first one. I get, uh, yeah, I was confused. I deliberately dropped the firewall as part of this test because I couldn't be bothered putting, setting up another rule on the firewall and then getting rid of it. Um, you would actually, more likely, if you change the port, you would fail at the firewall rather than at the listener. Oh, I'll skip that. Basically, if you have got, for any reason, machines on different ports, it doesn't matter. Once you've created a session to it, you can mix and max, match the sessions because you're running over the sessions and it, it just works. Okay. So this one you might this is one that you might see. So poor old Bill is going to try and connect. Notice we get access denied again. And what do people need to be to do remoting? Beg your pardon? Yeah. 
Yeah. So looking at the securities on the endpoints, the administrators are allowed, the remote management users are allowed. Local administrators contain the domain admins and the local administrator. There's nobody in remote management. And if we look at poor old Bill, all he's in is the domain users. So he's got no chance. And the other alternative is, do you know this one? Uh, you can actually pop the, um, pop the thing up and have a look at the security on the endpoint. So how do you get around giving somebody access that isn't in domain admins or isn't an administrator or a member of that group? You could add them to the group, but pardon? Yeah. Who said you? Yeah? The other one's for you. I'm not going to throw it because if you miss the catch, it'll take your head off. <laughs> yeah. This is where Jia comes in. If you've got people that you don't want to give full administration access to, but you need them to do some sorts of things like this, Jia is great because you can lock them down and you can do that. And if you try to do anything else, no, no chance. Um, anybody tried to do this? Connecting by an IP address rather than the computer name. This is a client-side issue. Um, it's nothing to do with your remote machine. You either use trusted hosts. Anybody use trusted hosts? Yeah? Yeah, don't put star in it. Naughty. <laughs> Stand up and apologize to everybody. <laughs> Guess what Project Honolulu does? Puts a star in. Trusted host. <laughs> Why not? On your computer, possibly, if you're talking about your workstation, then it probably is okay. But I've seen a lot of people do that on servers, the jump off servers. That's where I would not want to see it. Does that sense? Yeah? So SSH? Yeah. It's a similar concept, but it's... But it has value. An IP address, saying, oh, I, I want, here's a list of IP addresses that I want to connect to doesn't have the value. Yeah. Because those don't correlate to the actual issue. Like the yeah. That's an actual question. Sorry, I don't want to... No, it, it's actually... <laughs> it, it's all right. <laughs> no, feel free. Um, the trusted host is, and the way it's handled in documentation, it, 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 it's bugged me for a lot of time, a long, long time, the, the way the, oh, just use trusted hosts. No, do it properly, use certificates. Yeah, and Windows has a certificate server. If you want a certificate to do remoting, it, do you know how much that would cost you using the Windows server? Nothing. Why mess around with trusted hosts? Put a certificate on there. Because that also handles your non-domain remoting, which inc incidentally, the SSH remoting is, for me, that's one of the big keys. It makes it a lot easier to do non-domain Windows remoting. It buzz directions. So, did I run that? Can't remember. Trusted hosts, it's just a, a string. You can put a set of machine, uh, a set of um, values in there. It's just a simple set item. And
that's how you get, get around that. Notice, yes, I did use trusted host rather than the, the certificate because I'm coming on to that next. Okay, I jumped ahead slightly by mentioning non-domain remoting. Do you like my naming convention? ND. <laughs> okay, we can't process it. Error occurred because Kerberos authentication said nah. And that's because it's not in the domain. And um, we know, oh, we hope it's there. Yes, I did remember to start that one up. Use trusted hosts or certificates. Now, that should be listening on 5986. There we go. And we can create a connection. And it's just a standard connection. And we go. The only thing that you need is that you will occasionally need your certificate server st stood up so that the server, the certificate can be tested. The other thing that you will need is a HTTPS listener. Do you remember the listener I showed you? It's just HTTP. Um, so standard listener looks like that with just the HTTP. Usually is called that for whatever bizarre reason. Um, but if you've been playing around with remoting like I do, that can change. So don't rely on the listener name. And on the remote machine, we've got an HTTPS and a HTTP. And the other thing that you will see is in the listener. You've got the transport and the address. Everybody know how to create an HTTP, another listener? All right. I'm not actually going to run through it, but the code is here. So get the thumbprint of your, or well, get yourself a certificate, SSL certificate first. Get it installed on the box. You all know how to do that? Yeah, great. Get the thumbprint of it. And then New WS man instance, winner on config listener, address equals star, because you, you don't actually know where your connectivity is going to come from. Transport is HTTPS, host name, the certificate thumbprint, and you're good. Apart from make sure there's a rule in the firewall that lets HTTPS through, and that's all it takes. Easy. Okay, some other things that you might see. If you get these sorts of error messages, kind of complete the operation within the time specified, that's a timeout setting issue. You can modify the timeouts. Most of the time, the default settings will work for you period. You'll see certain people who insist that you have to change this and you have to change that and you have to change the other. No. The vast majority of the time, remoting just works. Leave it alone. Let it get on with its job. The two places where you might very, very occasionally hit issues are timeouts and the amount of data that you're transferring. If you fall over on the amount of data you're transferring, the question then is, why are you transferring massive amounts of data? Think about the process rather than changing remoting. And in the 
what I had. Yes, it was this one. That's what I wanted to show you. So you see the, you've got timeouts, you've got envelope size, and there's something down in here somewhere as well. Yeah, you've got another timeout down here. So you can modify those. Um, if need be, but think about what you're actually doing as to whether it's, you actually do need to change them. And the way to change them is you, change, you can actually override them on the PS session option. If you've not seen that before, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff down in here for the data sizes and there's some stuff for timeouts as well. Yeah, down here. Right, so I've shown you a few ways that remoting can be broken and how you can go about fixing them. The, um, so how was I doing the testing? And basically all I was doing was running, sorry, it is that one. I'm just running a series of pester tests so is the service running? Is the listener there using test path? Is the listener enabled? Is the transport set for HTTP? Is it listening on the right addresses? Is the port correct? Does the endpoint exist? Is it enabled? Is there a firewall rule? Blah, 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 blah. Is remoting enabled? That was an interesting one to test. And the only way I could think of it was actually testing the, the permissions. But um, if anybody thinks of a better way, let me know. And then, so that's a series of pest tests. What I wanted to do, though, was I wanted it to set to stop when it hit a problem, rather than going through and doing all the other tests. So what I did was wrap that and just run each test individually. And as soon as one breaks, we stop and output the results. And that's why it always said, it, this has failed at the bottom. And that's it. That, to me, that is a testing and troubleshooting met methodology that you could put against anything. And it's extensible. It's understandable. You can give that to somebody else to run without any problems. And I think it's another good use for Pesto. And I think that's it. Yep, we got to that. So if there's questions, that's great. If there isn't, that's great. Thank you very much from myself and Anthony. You've been a great audience. And I was trying to ignore you, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir.